there folks, I'm Dan Brown from Sort of Interesting and welcome to my boat life. What an absolutely amazing view of Chirk Aqueduct and Viaduct. You don't get that every day. Almost a decade ago, I moored up my first ever narrowboat at Chirk Bank, preparing to spend the winter afloat. The first time that I ever opened the curtains to discover that it had snowed overnight, I couldn't believe how fantastic the canal environment looked. Fast forward all these years to the present day, and with the strange circumstances of a third national lockdown, I once again find myself in the area, and once again with an amazing covering of snow. Despite all of the years of boat life that I now have behind me, I still think that Waking up and seeing this sort of scene through your window is one of the most enjoyable experiences in the whole of narrowboat life. Now, that might be because it's rare to get this level of snow in this part of the UK, so snow's always a novelty, and add in this amazing canal scenery, it pushes it to the next level. Or perhaps the fact that I now have a car so I don't have to go out and wait for a bus or pedal my bike in these conditions plays into why I enjoy it so much. There is very often something else that follows the snow if you live on a boat and that is people who are unfamiliar with boats saying things like this. Oh I bet it's cold on that boat. Oh are you warm enough out there? Have you got your thermals on? and so on. And I personally think that, from my experience at least, this is one of the biggest myths about boat life. And the irony is that my boat during the winter months will be far warmer for far more of the time than almost anybody's house who's ever asked me that question. A good example here, at 10 to midnight, the weather forecast is saying minus three outside, but when we look at the thermometer, the temperature on the boat is 30 degrees. Now that's actually far too hot. And if I was actually in the living room rather than the bedroom, I'd have to open the windows or maybe even open a door to let some of the heat out. And that's not an uncommon thing to do, certainly on my boat when I get a bit carried away with stacking the fire. In my opinion, there are two simple reasons as to why it's so easy to heat up a narrowboat to such a relatively high temperature. The first is pretty obvious, it's a very small area to heat. As you can imagine, a narrowboat is very narrow, and more significantly than that, I think, is the fact that the ceiling is not very high at all compared especially to some of the older houses in the UK that have much higher ceilings than the more modern houses. So you're not heating up all of that space above your head before you really start to feel the benefit as the room warms up. And the second thing, in fact, you've seen everything you need to see with me talking directly to camera now. The second reason why it's so easy to get my boat up to such a high temperature is the fact that the heat source itself is so intense. Anybody who's got a log burner or a coal fire in their house or anybody who's been in a pub, remember those days where there's an open fire, will likely know the absolutely intense, almost overwhelming heat that these things can throw out. So couple that with such a small area as a boat and you've got yourself a recipe for ludicrous temperatures. Another quick time and temperature example here. So it was eight degrees outside, 6.05 in the morning. I'd just woken up. And as you can see, without the fire being touched for hours, it was still about 25 degrees in the living room. It's important to remember that as we're looking at these amazing and genuinely beautiful snowy scenes, that the reality of a British winter is far more like this than it is these beautiful, crisp, snowy days. Uh, but I'm still walking. <laughs> more fool me! Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to suggest that every boat is absolutely roasting hot all through conditions like this. 
However, there'll also be some people who are looking at my video while they're on board their much fancier, more modern boat than mine, thinking, flipping heck, this lad hasn't even got proper heat and he's still burning sticks. What's he doing? Living in 1850? And, uh, well, all I can say is it's my simple little life on my simple little boat. And if it allows me to enjoy environments like this in a relatively low-cost manner, then I couldn't be more grateful for everything that I've got. I do want to take a moment now to talk about the extraordinary negative effects that the winter can have on boat life. Now, firstly, if you do get loads of snow, then you can actually have boats sinking. And I remember during that first winter on board, when we had some really heavy snow a couple of nights in a row, I think along this top section of the Langoflin Canal, there were about five boats sank. And that to me is a very scary thought. There's also some very overwhelmingly negative things that can happen to the canals themselves at this time of year. With all of the extra rain and water coming out of the sky and seeping into the canals and into the ground surrounding the canals, it's not uncommon to have canal breaches along the network. And in fact, even as we speak, there's one on the Shropshire Union Canal that the Canal and River Trust have said is not likely to be repaired until the summer. And of course, perhaps the most obvious thing that can happen during these wet winter months is flooding. And this is part of why I would be too scared to have my boat on a river during the autumn or winter months. And that is that you can see the water level rise and you might not be able to get beneath certain bridges so you'll become stuck and stranded on certain sections of river. And equally, if you have more extreme flooding, then you might find yourself coming back to a sunken boat or after the waters have receded, you might find that your boat is left literally high and dry, maybe on the towpath, maybe it's broken free and gone off somewhere further downstream. I've actually got a good indication of the power of weather and nature given enough time in the local area. Many visitors to Chirk Aqueduct may recognise this derelict house and may have also picked up on this huge drop in the land on this little access road, only just around the corner, a few hundred feet away from the aqueduct itself. And you can see that there's a good amount of inches that the land has slipped by. I don't know if this is technically subsidence or if there's a proper term for these things, but I was curious about this. So I went down to the River Kiriog in the field behind, and as you'll see, it's a really steep hillside up to the back of that derelict house. And actually, in real time, day to day, I've seen bits of this chipped away and falling away due to the weather in the river. And even while I've been stood there watching, I've seen just small pockets of soil and stones falling out from amongst other tree roots that are still standing that obviously in time are going to be falling into the river to join the many others there. To end this video on a more upbeat note, I'd like to share a few of my pictures in response to a previous video I'd done where I couldn't believe just how many comments and how much people seem to enjoy some of the photos that I'd taken. So thank you very much for that. I also want to say that it's not going to be quite as long until the next video comes out as I struggled with this video because I had two separate pieces I was working on at the same time which the one half has basically morphed into its own entire other video so that will be coming in the next few weeks so thank you so much for your patience and thank you for the support as always I'd like to also say thank you to all the channel members and the PayPal supporters. Uh, Mr. Quiet U, 112, Rory58, Darren C, JK Jensen, John B, Lydia B, CG, and Adrian B. Thank you all so much for everything. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And until the next time, have an absolutely fantastic day. Keep it interesting. Keep it boat worthy. And of course, Farewell.